pieces, if you will. And Socrates admits that the apprenticeship slash education of these potential guardians would be very, very long. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't even be qualified to become part of the Council of Guardians until they were in their 40s, most likely. Yeah. So to just bring in a component of the current government. So the presidency is often referred to as the loneliest place ever. And it sounds a lot like this would be its own bubble as well. And I think that isolation might not be like a perfect plan to create a president or a council or anything that can I don't all of society. I don't, I don't know that you're wrong, but I can at least give you something like a platonic justification for this. Number one, the more that these wise individuals are, are interacting with things that could knock them away from enlightenment, puts the entire system in danger according to this. And I'm not saying I agree with it, I'm just kind of laying that out. Now the other thing is, the Council of Guardians has the warriors as their eyes and their ears. In other words, these guys are going to be doing the footwork for the guardians. Now, of course, <coughs> that sounds eerily like a police state. Seriously, it sounds eerily like martial law. I mean, you can, th you can imagine a dystopian thick piece of uh, fiction being based upon this, and guess what? Dystopian pieces of fiction have been, you know, sort of critical of this. I'll give you one example. My son and daughter in middle school both read the piece of dystopian youth fiction, The Giver, which is kind of based on this kind of idea. And by the way, the, the film version of that was just utter crap. I mean, I mean, the, the dude was totally chewing the scenery. Yeah, I'm a film critic, too. You know the dude, I'm talking about uh, uh, Jeff Bridges. He was like, he, they shoved rocks in his mouth when he was talking and so forth. Yeah, but that's kind of, but I haven't noticed that in a lot of Jeff Bridges movies, that's the way he talks like... Uh, Rooster Cogburn, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's in some commercial right now, I think, where, he, where he's like, has his mouth full of pebbles or something like this. But anyway, I better behave myself a tiny little bit. But in The Giver, you have these individuals who have all the, in, the institutional wisdom, if you will, they're the ones who have the secret knowledge of the way things used to be and the way things work right now. And of course, what they, they've done with these people right here, and by the way, in Plato's ideal republic, these people wouldn't even really know who the guardians were. And that's not because of these people, that's because of the guardians. Can you guess what I mean? It's exactly, it's the problem with democracies. Our leaders become American royalty. They are paying massive amounts of money, and when you make a lot of money and you have huge houses and are constantly going on golf junkets, what happens to your humility? If you even had it in the first place. Humility out the window. And of course, the more stuff you get, even if you started out a decent, enlightened leader wanting to, to save Washington, you won't be like uh, Jimmy Stewart in, uh, in uh, Mr. Smith. You, you will end up joining. I mean, you saw the old movie, Mr. S Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The problem's graft. It's graft, I tell you. That's not my best Jimmy Stewart. But anyway, Jimmy Stewart wouldn't go to Washington and nobly change the system in real life, in real America. Guess what would happen? The system will change him. Yeah, he would become just as bad as the system that he went out to try to switch. So the idea is if you keep these guardians in their bubble, you will lower the chance of any of them going off the rails. And this is why Plato says these guys will not be given any kind of special royal treatment. Because the royal treatment would end up making them worse. And by the way, 
In a way, you don't want these people to know who they are either, even though we would think of it as accountability. Because these people might start to get the wrong idea about these people, and actually what? Worship them. Treat them like royalty. Yeah, King Trump or King Barack or whatever. You get the idea? Or I can think of some of my colleagues, and I don't want to mention any of them by name, but I think they, they set up JFK as some kind of god. You guys may have met some of these people who I'm talking about. And then we have one of our speech instructors who retired the other year. I mean, for him, like, Ronald Reagan was Jesus Christ times two. I mean, he was like, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan. I'm like, these people are leaders. They are fallible. And most of the time, they were full of crap when they were talking to the American people. But unfortunately, in, the, in a cult of personality and hero worship, that's the problem you get. You get people who are all too willing to what? To bow down and serve their masters. I sound like I'm quoting songs every other minute. My life is a cliche of song quotations, and I do apologize if you caught any of those. Yeah, anyway, well, most of it's like from the 90s, so uh, anyway, it kind of shows you where I am. But anyway, I'll behave myself a... Did I answer to your question a little bit? I know it wasn't an answer, and guess what? I don't know that it can be. I think it's the best non-answer to an unanswerable question. Thank you very much. I'll take that. Now, the next kind of things that I want to mention is how do you determine... Who determines who gets to be the guardians? Well, the current guardians get to determine who the qualified guardians will be. Now, some of the people who look at Plato's ideal state, they call this question, they say, most of us tend to value our liberty. The idea that I can strive and try to be and make of my life whatever I want to make of it. Now, in Plato's ideal society, your qualities are what choose for you what you're going to do, not what your haphazard desires are. Now, who is it who will see what your qualities are? Anybody? The guardians. Yeah, the guardians. The guardians will observe the children in the nurseries. And by the way, all of the children after they are born are taken to the nurseries to be cared for by the most qualified child rearers. Because guess what, according to Plato? Just like where we, we talk about people's values are learned at home, guess what? That's where hate and racism are learned. In other words, we want to take power out of the hands of haphazard individuals. In Plato's society, there is no more this. He hypothesized getting rid of what we would call the nuclear family. Oh, and by the way, how many of you have seen the film Gattaca? Stars Ethan Hawke. I, mean, I, I, I don't like Ethan Hawke. I don't know why, but I... It's fair. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just saying. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, in Gattaca, Gattaca is another one of these future world dystopian societies. And there's something in it that is extremely platonic. In Gattaca, there are no more what were called love children. My children would be called love children, although maybe lust children would be more appropriate. Oh, come on, I'm trying to be funny here, folks. But you know, love children, where two people decide to come together of their own volition, couple, and they have children. That is outlawed in this future world of, of the, in the film Gattaca, which is very much like in Plato's ideal republic. The guardians will determine who are the most fit to breed. So you will have women, the best and the brightest and the fittest, who will be called upon to do their sexual duty for the state, 
And the best and the brightest of men will be also selected for the breeding. Of course, this all makes the sex act sound extremely mechanical. For those of you who are looking for love, and the kind of love that we tend to want, and this is another one of the givers type criticisms of a platonic type republic, that kind of filial love would also be taken away. Because it is something that's oftentimes considered to be chaotic and problematic. And I want this to sound just as bad as it's going to sound. There are some people, according to Plato, who just shouldn't breed. It's not good for them. It's also not good for the greater good of society. As a matter of fact, I might not have been selected to do such a thing because by nature, only recently have I become any kind of decent facsimile of a father. And I'm being honest, I'm willing to go on camera saying this, and my wife would thoroughly agree. Because a father is supposed to love his children thoroughly and unconditionally. My society taught me to think of my children as costs of doing business. In other words, I'll borrow that line from a TV show. How many of you have seen the TV show Breaking Bad? I was taught to think of my fatherly roles in the same way as the iconic drug kingpin Gus Spring was. A man's duty is to provide. That was something he constantly told uh, the character Walter White. A man's duty is to provide. I was a provider. I was a checkbook. And by the way, when you're taught to think of yourself as a checkbook, it's no wonder you become a little what? Materialistic. Yeah, and I'm going to say, and resentful. And you also become, and I was, I'm willing to admit this, I think I was less than human at the time. Because I did reduce things to cash exchange. And when you live your life that way, it's very difficult to quote unquote love anybody, let alone yourself. And those were the kind of attitudes that I learned where? From your parents. Yeah. I learned, and I learned them from my society. You know, money, I was taught that money can buy happiness, even though everybody said that it couldn't. You know what I mean? And I always looked at my role as being able to give my children monetary stuff, and that was, you know, the thing that mattered, as opposed to giving them love, decency, and stability. Go ahead. Do you think we should kill the phrase, uh, money buys happiness, or do you think we should revise it to money facilitates happiness? Yeah, what I, what I like to say, and this is the phrase I have, is money certainly can't buy happiness. But it sure can make, uh, it can make happiness a little more possible. And by happiness, I mean the opposite of unhappiness. If you're starving to death and don't know where, uh, where your next meal's coming from, and you don't have a roof over your head, it's possible to be happy, but very, very difficult. But you'll notice that the person who has everything very frequently is what? Unhappy to the core. And I'm willing to go on record saying this. I know some of you might love the POTUS. He does not strike me as a happy human being. A person with that much anger within him cannot be happy. A person who has to flaunt his wealth as a sign of how awesome he is and constantly has to be praised is not a happy person. A happy person like Socrates, to borrow that, that phrase, does not look where for his happiness. Doesn't look to external things. Doesn't need people to bow down and worship him all the time. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even afraid to die. He didn't care that the most powerful people in Athens were out for his head. He was happy with less. He wasn't constantly striving for more. 
He appreciated the idea that everything you need to be, you already have. Everything you need to be, you already have. Now, I wouldn't say that for everybody, but for a person who is enlightened, everything you need and ought to be, you already have. 49. Oh, bother. Now, one last little thing I wanted to mention before we part. And I, gave, I sent you an email, please take a look at that, about the test and so forth. <coughs> Keep in mind that some people also say, what about moving up in the world? Well, guess what Plato has removed from our vocabulary? There is no such thing as moving up or moving down. Guess why? Because everyone has his own place. Yeah, because there is no hierarchy. And nobody is taught to think of themselves as any better, worse, or necessary than anyone else. Now, some Americans will say, doesn't that take away the incentive to work hard? Because don't people only work hard if they think they're going to get something from it? Well, my platonic answer to that is this. That is the way materialistic, self-indulgent people are taught to think. <laughs> if you are taught to think of rewards intrinsically as about being the best person that you can possibly be and self-development, then doing the things that you're doing well will be what? will be its own reward. And I guess we have to go out with, on that cliche note. <coughs> Any questions, feel free to drop me a line.